we're going to talk about this particular topic. And I have a feeling if you're reading the work that comes out of um, this university, out of Pat's lab, etc., that we're going to have a lot in common. And one of the messages would be that despite being some you know 14 hours on a flight away plus a half hour in the pouch of a kangaroo, you know, getting to the airport <laughs> and all of those things. We actually share a lot of the same research questions and common goals in research. What I'd like to think is that we can see increasing amounts of work in our field to collaborate on projects so that we can increase our, our sample size, so we can do work with greater scale, international relevance, etc. In starting out, I'd like to acknowledge all of the children, the many children and the parents and the staff who have been part of the research studies that we will I'll talk about in this particular presentation. And to acknowledge my colleagues, we have Giacomo Vivanti at the Drexel Autism Institute in Philly, Teresa Iacono at La Trobe University, Veronica Rose and Riley Sulik at Griffith University, who are my uh, PhD students, Cheryl Disnayaka, who is a director of the Olga Tennyson Autism Research Centre at La Trobe University, um, Dr. Jessica Painter, Griffith University in Psychology, and Stephanie Sievers, who will borrow from um, North America, who's currently doing her PhD in our lab as well. I don't have anything to declare in terms of um, conflicts of interest, although I must say, in spending time in Vancouver, I've got this subtle, sort of less subconscious and more conscious thought that maybe. I've got a, a, a motivation to try and work here one day. Um, so that's part of the, that's, I guess I need to be upfront about that. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm supported by the National Health and Medical Research Council in Australia, which provides a fellowship which is an enormous privilege and allows me to spend four years just doing research. A PhD or higher education, higher degree research is such a a privilege, and I remember loving those years I did my PhD. And, you know, many of you will be going through that at the moment, and to have the opportunity to continue to do some of that work in the form of fellowship is a, is a great gift. In terms of what I, I'd like to discuss today, these are the, the key things. So I'd like to talk a little bit about individual differences in autism, yes, and, and language more broadly. I'd like to talk about augmentative communication and individual differences. Some of the approaches that we're using to look at individual differences and perhaps a framework which we might want to use if we're not already doing so to approach this issue. And then to, of course, at all times think about the clinical and the research implications. I'm looking forward to discussing what I present and getting your feedback on it, sharing your thoughts and perspectives. So we start out with this idea of individual differences, autism and language, and I think sometimes within the research field, individual differences are almost presented as, as like they're something unique to autism or even a problem in some ways. But you know, I think it's good to constantly kind of recalibrate and, and remember that individual differences is what we have to celebrate in life. It's everything about being human is to be different. You know? do with those and how we understand those that matters. But every opportunity in life comes from a difference. Everything that's great happens because of a difference between the way someone thinks, they act, or they collect other people around them and do. So there's something very powerful and very special about these. And certainly when we look in the area of development, individual differences are not something that's unique when it comes to language in children with autism. This morning I was just having a flip through my slides and I thought, I'd like to include this, so I'm sorry it's not in your handout, but it comes from an article um, looking at outcomes of the early learning, early language in Victoria study. So this is the state of Victoria in Australia, and a group of researchers over about 12, 14 years have tracked the development of about 1,200 children from the community community sample, so this includes kids with all sorts of different developmental trajectories, from those that are what we might describe as typically developing to kids who have language delays, autism, cerebral palsy, and everything else. One of the things that was fascinating about the, the outcomes of the, it is fascinating about the outcomes of the study so far has been the work around trajectories of development. 
So my understanding is that the research team, when they set out to do this work, had a belief that they would be able to identify different pathways of language development. And I think the, the hypothesis was that they would be relatively stable, that early experiences, I guess including um, you know, genetic capital that you're born with, as well as the environment that you're raised in, would have a, quite an important effect or influence on your language development at an early age, and that would then carry through with you albeit kind of buffered by different other experiences into school and then out of life. What they found instead, um, when they used later class analysis, was these kind of like a spaghetti effect of language development trajectories. So they had kids who, if we look at the mean scores, so they've tried to find a way to look at the language development relative to one another between the groups. We had kids who started out up high, so above average in language development, who found their way back to average. We had kids who were average, who found their way into a, a category described as having a language disorder. Kids who were quite low in language, who were in the middle. Basically, every different path you could describe. It's really not a straightforward process. And these are kids just with language disorder, not, not with autism. So we can only imagine that the picture is just as complex for our kids that we work with. So sometimes I think it's good to kind of, as a starting point, you know, appreciate that it's always going to be messy and to really embrace that in the way that we work. We're never going to be able to predict or explain everything about a child's development, nor should we try, I don't, I don't think, more on that later. The thing about those, that figure, though, when you look at it, so I'll just jump back to it quickly, is that when we look at the five groups that are represented there, four of the five groups find their way to kind of average language or above average language. These are kids who have now the skills they need to go into school and to flourish, to thrive, and to you know, develop those relationships, to learn that content, to put all the pieces together in order to have you know, a lot of choices in their lives. There's one group down here who has language delay at this point at 48 months of age. These kids are certainly at risk for all of those same things and need to be the focus of supports. What I'd suggest is that the kids in our group, kids with autism, are at particular risk, at heightened risk. That is, I think we see more of them, a disproportionate number of children in this virus group. And we see them presenting with quite significant needs. We looked at this issue, my colleagues and I, so Veronica Rose, like this PhD student, and my other colleagues, Deb Keen and Jess Panzer, we wanted to look at sort of the outcomes, the language outcomes for children on the autism spectrum who attended a, a community-based program. And this is a program that operates in Australia and provides support to services to about 250 children on the spectrum per annum in the preschool years, from about 24 months through to about six years of age when they start school. It does so across a number of sites. And if you can imagine each, each site, there'll be, you know, usually two to four classrooms, <coughs> each classroom about 10 children, about five, five staff members. And these will be staff members from a range of disciplines, including um, teachers and allied health professionals, childcare workers, um, psychologists, etc., behaviour therapists, as well in recent times. So a lot of kids go through this program, and as part of that, my colleagues and I, we, we do assessments at regular intervals, annual assessments, to track how the kids are progressing, and then to try to look at factors that seem to um, influence which how children um, respond to the program. So we took the, the data that's been collected over the last three or four years, and we asked the question, how many of these kids who start the program with a, a, a language delay, or a minimally verbal, if you like, how many of those kids end up or exit the program in the same situation? How many change over time? Our sample includes about well, included 246 children. Um, and as I mentioned, the service is provided by a multidisciplinary team. It's a comprehensive program, so targeting all areas of development, social communication, play, um, etc., fine motor skills. 
And kids attend from about nine to three each day and for the intervention component, and then up to another two hours either side to their parents who are working. You can see here that on this table, we've got the entry and the exit data for the kids. And we've got the different assessments that we've used down the left hand side here. And I'll describe the assessment tools in a minute for those not familiar. What we see here is that at, in terms of age of entry and exit, an average of about 44 months of intake and about 60 months at exit. So these were older children, and we should keep that in mind as we talk through the results. The program caters for any children who have a diagnosis of being on the autism spectrum. So it does catch a wider net of kids. It's not just children with more um, significant needs. But nevertheless, there are plenty of children, as you'll see, represented in the sample who do have, who do have quite significant learning needs. So let's have a look at some of the, the data. The first assessment we looked at was the social communication questionnaire. Now, one of the issues in the field, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, is that we really have very little understanding of the proportion of kids who receive intervention who end up developing functional speech, and those who continue to have difficulties. And there's very little consensus in the field about how to actually assess spoken language outcomes for kids, which creates a real challenge in trying to get good data on this. When we reviewed the literature, we found a handful of studies, you know, like three, four, where the proportion of minimally verbal children that is actually you know, investigated. And we get these kind of broad estimates around 25 to up to 50 percent in the older days. My our hypothesis was that we'd actually see quite a, a small number of children, a small proportion of the minimally verbal at the end of the program, given all of the advances in early intervention. So we embarked on this study, and to look at this question, we didn't have language samples for all the children. We weren't able to apply, say, um, Helen Taylor Flusberg's um, criteria for spoken language outcomes. But we could go back to some of these standardised assessments and look at item level analysis to get an inkling sense of what these children, how they were communicating. This has been done once before by Norelgen and colleagues. And it's a way that we offers a bit of, you know, some promise in terms of giving us a mechanism by which we can have an insight into spoken language outcomes across studies without necessarily needing to have more assessments for already often congested values. You know? We can't put kids through assessment after assessment after assessment. So we applied this approach. The social communication questionnaire, it's a front and back questionnaire, we're about 40 questions, 40 items. And it looks at children's social and communication development as well as um, behaviour. And it's actually relevant for all the groups as well. We looked at this particular item using phrases or sentences, the first item on the questionnaire. And what's interesting here is if we look at that entry, the, the proportion of children who are using phrases or sentences, and if we follow the no, we find about 62.5% are not using it phrases or sentences. By the end of the program, that's down to about 32.1%. So about a 30% change in the proportion of children using phrases or sentences after 12 months of intervention. The Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, for those who of you who aren't familiar, is a, a standardised assessment in terms of administration um, of the tool. It takes about 30 to 45 minutes. It's a play-based assessment involving a trained clinician and a child, during which time the clinician creates lots and lots of opportunities for presses, as they're described in the ADOS, for communication and interaction, etc. At the end of this interaction, we code the child's behaviour in the areas of social communication and behaviour. One of the first items, the first item on the ADOS asked to describe the, the nature of the child's um, language. So do they get a score of zero in terms of regular use of utterances with two or more words? A score of one for occasional phrases only, mostly single words. Two, for recognising single words, for word approximations only. They must use at least five different words. Three, at least one or word, word approximation, but fewer than five words. And four, no words or word approximations. 
And what the ADOS has different modules, which are designed for different age groups as well as different, um, one of the better term, levels of ability in these particular areas. So if we look at the first, the score of zero and one, these are kids who are regularly using utterances or occasional phrases. We see an intake, we have about 50% of those kids are doing that. The other 50 are getting scores below that. By the end, this is up to what, 54 plus 15, so 69% of kids. About 31% of children who are exiting the program still not using phrases, um, phrase level speech. They're limited to a smaller number of words, and they're not joining those words together. We then looked at it in terms of the Mullen scales of early learning. A play-based assessment, standardised and norm reference, which allows us to look at visual reception, such as sorting and, and um, matching skills, fine motor skills, receptive and expressive <coughs> language. We took two items here, in terms of item 11, saying the first words, and item 17. And you'll see a similar pattern here. So when we look at the kids who are producing eight words or more, about half, by the end of the program, that is, it's gone up to about 66%. So we're seeing an increase in those skills, but still many children who are not progressing in that way. And the same effect for the users two words. So at the start, <coughs> the kids not combining two words into phrases, and by the end, it's dropped to around 36.4%. Finally, we have the parent report measure, the fine motor adaptive behaviour scales, social skills, communication skills, fine motor daily living skills, and behaviour although behaviour is not included in this. And we used item 12 and 18. <coughs> in the sense of which children we could describe as not harsh than the two word combinations. We appreciate that these are very crude measures of this concept of being nearly verbal or not. But it's what we could glean from the, the item level analysis. At intake, about 53.5% of children non-verbal about another 20 minimally verbal, so around 73%, 74. And by the end, we're looking at around 45%. What's interesting here is that we're getting very consistent measures across a consistent picture, across those tools that a clinician implemented or parent implemented. So we're getting some convergence of data, which is always a good thing in research. So based on direct assessment, we find that about 26.3% of the kids exit the program using fewer than five words. 36.4, we're not using two word phrases. Now I mentioned that the program caters for kids across the spectrum, and there's no doubt we had plenty of kids in the program at the start who were using little or no language. But what this suggests to us is there is a significant, substantial, unmet need in early intervention, at least in this program, and we don't believe it's exclusive. And that clearly, augmentative communication might be a viable um, option for these kids, aimed at supporting their communication development. So we see a clear role for AAC or potential role. Now, in thinking about the audience today, and thinking about um, Pat, Miranda, I thought, it's highly, highly <laughs> unlikely, highly, highly unlikely, that there is anyone in this room who doesn't know what augmentative communication is. And that would include people who study history and geology and all sorts of you know, physics. I imagine you've probably infused a rather large university with the notion of what it is. But I thought just in case, I would mention that these are approaches for supporting language development. They're aimed to um, create opportunities for communication, provide means by which that can occur. They include things that are unaided, such as menu signing. Things that are aided that have a technology component, including voice output devices or speech generating devices. Of course, we're missing the iPads and the tablets and the phones. And lower tech communication aids, including communication books, communication boards, and things like um, chat books. What I think is really important is that this idea, when we see someone like Stephen Hawkins, you know, acclaimed physicist using AAC to communicate, the device is, of course, just one part of this support. It's not an intervention, but, you know, support or, or way of communicating. 
There's vocabulary that this is a device, there's a method for access, there are communication partners who understand that this is important, that engage in that communication in partnership, and all of the other things, the training that goes into it. AAC is a system, of course, and we have to remember that. We have to remember it in particular, of course, when working with clients, but second most importantly, when evaluating the research evidence in AAC. I believe that a lot of the research that is conducted or has been conducted today separates the device from the system, or only includes a small number of those components within the system. Now, it's done for very good reasons in terms of um, you know, experimental control and whatnot, but we always have to keep in mind that that's one of the limitations of research um, in this field. We also, most always, most often, see AAC kind of divorced from the broader educational context in which it's being used when evaluated in research studies. So we'll see a study involving the use of PECs in a clinic room but no, no contextualisation within the child's broader educational program. This is both a challenge in interpreting the literature, but it's also a, a tremendous opportunity. But I think as a field we're going to embrace more and more, looking at the opportunities to embed AAC within a comprehensive program, which is of course gold standard best practice for supporting development in children on the autism spectrum. It's a consistent recommendation across every key guideline. The program should be comprehensive. <clears throat> so we do have, um, we're fortunate with an AAC to have a, a, a quite a, a rapidly growing body of literature, I would say, looking at the effectiveness of interventions. And I, I tip my hat to Jennifer Gans and colleagues who have done some great work over the last few years, looking at outcomes from AAC interventions and starting to look at some of the factors that seem to be associated with different outcomes. So Jennifer and colleagues looked at research from about 1980 through to about 2013 for this particular review. And they looked for studies in which single case experimental designs were used to evaluate the effectiveness of augmentative and alternative communication systems for children with autism in the preschool years. To do this, to make sense of this literature as part of the meta-analysis, they use this in effect size measure called the improvement rate of difference. And essentially what it does is look at the improvement that occurs in the intervention phase and looks at the improvement that occurs spontaneously in the baseline phase through the look looking at the overlap of data points and provides an effect size. This effect size is generally interpreted as the small being below 50.5 or below, the moderate being 0.5 to 0.7, and a large being 0.7 or greater. When we look at the outcomes of the meta-analysis, what's been helpful here is they've grouped the, the dependent variables, the target behaviours, according to the following categories, the so communication, social skills, challenging behaviour and academic skills. And it's fairly easily apparent from this particular slide, once we transpose the effect sizes, that across each of these areas we're seeing average large effects for AAC interventions. It's a very positive story that comes out of this work, suggesting that there's a great deal of potential for the use of AAC. What's particularly interesting though, in my mind, was the second figure they presented, the second forest plot. So they took each of the studies that were included, 24, the medical inclusion criteria. These are all studies in which an experimental effect for intervention was demonstrated. So they had appropriate control, etc. And they then um, plotted the individual outcomes. And suddenly we see a more interesting picture, where some studies we've seen small to no effect, others large and some in the middle. What's particularly interesting are these confidence intervals. What it's suggesting that not only across the studies, but within the studies, we're seeing a lot of individual variability. Clearly, different people are responding to AAC in different ways, which we should expect, just like any other educational approach or intervention. What we are um, very pleased to do, though, no doubt, is to understand some of the factors that are relevant to these different responses to intervention. What might be the play? <coughs> now, 
Now, in thinking about the outcomes, one thing that strikes me is we, you know, I love as much as anyone else a good effect size measure, right? And it's very clean and easy to make judgments based on those two figures, and it absolutely has to happen in research. One of the challenges I have, though, with this approach is sometimes it's difficult to really kind of tease out what is the clinical implication of this work. How much of these children actually kind of change or evolve in their communication as a result of the intervention? So I was having a look at literature not long ago, as I generally do, and I was actually following up on this article by Leo Kenner, where he historical perspectives on developmental disorders. This was published back in 1973, and it's interesting, even just in those sort of, what is it, 30 years that he's reflecting on, a lot of the lessons and things that he talks about are still kind of rotating around and around today, including the idea of individual differences and trying to understand those. So yes, we're moving forward, but we're still grappling with many of the same issues. But then this um, article down the bottom caught my attention by Dr. Kenneth Mark Colby from Stanford University. And so I had a bit of a read. I had a read of the article, which we'll talk about, but I also had a bit of a read about him. He's got quite an interesting sort of story. So he's a person who specialises in artificial intelligence and other kind of computery kind of stuff. So he approached the question of computers and children with autism and how it might support learning from a very, I'm assuming, um, quite an analytical perspective. I wouldn't have needed to come at it with, you know, wouldn't have brought with it probably the experience of education for children on the spectrum, personal experiences, all of those sorts of things. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong, Dr. Colby, but that was my sense. He also um, developed uh, some software that tried to replicate paranoia, paranoid thoughts that are often seen in people with schizophrenia, and managed to pass the Turing test, I learned, which is where if you have an operator, interact with either a computer or a human via a computer. The Turing test is one in which you say, can the operator work out which, whether she or he is talking to a computer or a real person? So apparently this technology passed the test, which is very clever. Although then I kind of was thinking about on, on the way here saying, if you flip the coin, you pass it one in two times. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's the, uh, the best way to assess it. But here's what I loved about this article. So talking about the methods that we use, and this was a computer instruction sort of approach. Kids were taught to, to name words by looking at a computer and engaging with it. Have a look at this. Every treatment method reports its dramatic successes with one or two cases. We need long-term case series before we can compare methods and decide which is more effective relative to the effort required. He's picking up on a trend in the literature, which is troubling, and an absolute imperative in thinking about effort versus benefit, the cost, etc., which um, obviously government and, and other policymakers care very much about. Look at this. Thus far, our case series of non-speaking autistic children is number 17, with 13 of the children improved. How clear and kind of honest and upfront is that? By improvement, we mean only that the child begins voluntarily to use speech for social communication. We do not claim our method results in normal language ability with full comprehension and correct pronunciation, syntax, and grammar. Our aim is to rekindle the child's interest in attempting speech to get him to try again, to get him off the ground, to stimulate or catalyze a damage to slow developing natural process of language acquisition. I think he probably wrote the best definition of ASE, sorry, um, <laughs> that, 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 that is in terms of what are we trying to achieve. He's got the social element, right? We've got the motivation element. We've got this idea that someone can be more than they currently are or do, can, can, you know, have more power than they currently have. To stimulate or catalyse a system of language acquisition, absolutely eloquent writing. Very honest and open reporting of results, a very clear thinking here in terms of what we're trying to achieve. We try to take both of those, keep both of those things in mind in the research that we do. So this issue then of AAC, what we're trying to achieve, but also the individual differences that we see. As I mentioned in talking about Leo Cannon very briefly there, Individual differences have been with us from the beginning of autism. 
Here's the original article. Here's Dr. Cameron. And note this um, quote. The article opens with, Since 1938, you have come to our attention, a number of children whose condition differs so markedly and uniquely from anything reported so far that each case merits, and I hope will eventually receive, the detailed consideration of, of his or her fascinating peculiarities. So again, in the beginning, it's right there, first paragraph. Fascinating? Yes, exactly. And can we actually help ensure that each child receives this acknowledgement? Certainly, we can do that through our research. Going on, it says, the 11 children whose histories have briefly been presented offer, as is to be expected in individual differences in the degree of their disturbances, the manifestation of specific features, the family constellation, step-by-step -step development in the course of years. But even a quick review of the material makes the emergence of a number of central common characteristics be inevitable. So yes, there are the core social communication, behavioural difficulties or differences that we see that are central to the descriptive diagnosis of autism, but also these individual differences. I note here too this notion of step development, step by step development in the course of years. And I think this is a message that we need to kind of keep in mind as we think about language development trajectories and the role of AAC and where it fits in. For extremely good reasons, scientific reasons, there's a strong emphasis in the early intervention field at the moment on developmental courses and pathways, looking and developing curriculums around that, and then helping, trying to help children walk through those curriculums and achieve every step. What I think it still remains to be better understood is whether all children follow that developmental path or whether some are more sporadic in the development because it certainly has implications for augmentative communication in terms of when you start, how you do it, and what you do when that occurs. I think that's something Leo Cannell was indicating that we could perhaps um, give further attention to. And certainly, when we look at, back to that early language in Victoria study, it suggests that these step-by-step -step developments and sort of a, a predictable path is unlikely to be there. Um, at least for most kids. So taking this on board, these sort of issues and, and sort of thinking about the challenges but also the opportunities, um, Giacomo Vivanti and I wrote this piece a couple of years ago. And what we were trying to do, it was sort of quite a, a good process in that it took us through our own thoughts about this idea of individual differences, what we understand about them, what we can learn from them. And we've arrived at this title in terms of them being problematic but predictive, you know? If we want to understand development, we have to look at these particular differences. And there's opportunities for us in this space. In looking at our work, and looking at the work Pat's doing, and looking at the, and I'm sure you're do, many of you are doing, in other um, groups around the world, it seems to me that we have these three core questions. The first is around differing in response to intervention, it's something that people have always wondered about, and I think we're getting better at being able to look at that and make judgments about that. Things like the National Autism Centre guidelines, the evidence-based practices, the Wong et al. review, um, the SRQ review, etc. We're at a point now where we do have a range of interventions, and we can start to see how children are responding to those. The second question around what predicts, mediates and moderates these outcomes is one also that's been with us for a while and will probably remain with us as interventions evolve because the predictors will presumably move with the interventions. This is my little girl, that's Giacomo um, from a few years back when we were doing this work. And uh, I try to include pictures of my kids to remind them when I'm away, and now she'll be famous on the videos. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Take these two things together. I think we've got this plain language question of what works for whom and why. In the study of predictors, there have been, I think, probably three main approaches in this area as well as more broadly in autism and more broadly, again, in development in general. 
Start off with the broad predictors. And these are things that we've kind of known about for quite some time. And you don't assume that they're really going to go away. I mentioned Jennifer Gans and colleagues have done a couple of great pieces of work, and I think this is the second one. Using the same studies from the previous meta-analysis, they went on to look at what factors seem to be related to differential responses to different interventions across children in these studies. So they had the 24 studies, and they broke them down to look at um, all the following characteristics. Here again, we have the improvement rate of difference, um, effect size measure. And what they're doing now is they're going to categorize or subgroup children across those studies and look at the effect sizes for interventions in those different subgroups. So we see here that the children comparing some children had some speech at the outset and their speech outcomes compared to non-speaking children at the outset. What's interesting here is we see that the children had some speech had greater effect sizes as a result of the interventions than the children who didn't. And what I think this clearly suggests or confirms is this notion of the Matthew effect, whereby you know, the rich the rich get richer. It certainly, though, doesn't have the flip side where the poor get poorer in my mind in this case. It's just a different response to the intervention. Gans and colleagues, they talked about the fact that this is promising in the sense, too, that for both groups, irrespective of whether children had speech or not, or lots or, or little to begin with, that both responded to the intervention by producing more speech, suggesting this is further evidence for the notion that AAC may do nothing or it may help. The second set of comparisons looked at um, children on the autism spectrum with and without an intellectual or developmental disability described or defined as either being two years below their chronological age in terms of age equivalent scores on assessments reported in the original articles, or um, standardised assessment scores below 70 for language or cognition of the cognitive assessments. Then they looked at, in terms of PECs, they looked at devices, and they looked at other picture-based AAC systems. So you can do some of your own comparisons here. But if we, I'll just do a couple. So if we take ASD, kids on the spectrum, X devices, and other picture-based systems, we see X being stronger, uh, sorry, uh, devices being stronger than X and stronger than um, other picture-based methods. Where's it this one, this one, this one? The interesting comparison though here I think, is the one where we say when you have kids on the spectrum with IDD versus kids on the spectrum without, we actually see greater effect sizes for interventions involving kids without IDD. And it's replicated there in terms of um, devices. It wasn't really dealt with in the article, but I think to me it suggests that two, probably two main things. The first is we're talking about 24 studies subgrouped and then subgrouped again. So we're getting down to very small numbers in each of those groupings. So comparisons become a little bit more um, risky. Our confidence, you know, very broad confidence intervals, aren't they? So I think that's probably one issue. The second issue is that we know that you can have a PEX intervention with kids with very significant needs, or a PEX intervention with kids with, with um, more skills, and they'll be compared in the same way. So we have to be careful in terms of interpreting the results. I think this is an extremely valuable contribution to the field, this work, but I feel like we're not yet at the stage where we could make a clinical decision about what to do for whom, when and why, based on these data. I think it shows us what needs to be done, but it also demonstrates we're not quite there at the stage. Finally, we have this, the comparisons for preschoolers, elementary and secondary school with um, the different types of devices. So preschoolers with SGBs tended to do better in terms of effect sizes than preschoolers using PECs. But the same issues, and you can see across age groups, the same essential issues um, remain in my mind in terms of interpreting that.
So what could we what could we do differently then? Broad predictors such as cognitive ability, um, age intake to intervention, language level prior to intervention. If these things are kind of blunt, not giving us the the finesse or sophistication that we need, where can we go? Obviously, fine grained predictors is an alternative, and I've included three um, pencils or paintbrushes here because I think when you're talking about fine, there will always be more than one. Certainly, I believe will be the case for understanding outcomes from AAC. Paul Yoda and Wendy Stone are amongst the first, I think, to do a really nice job looking at this particular issue. Some of you will have read this paper in which they took two interventions, RPMT and PECS, and provided those to groups of children on the autism spectrum. They have 36 preschoolers with ASD divided into the two groups, and they have the two interventions. The interventions differed across all of these things in terms of where the um, sessions took place, behaviours taught, when to use um, explicit prompts for words, etc. <coughs> and so you can see that they, they differ in terms of their focus and the way that they're actually implemented. That's all interesting. Um, and certainly it was very important to look at these two interventions, and still is. We need more research comparing um, intervention approaches. And we'll get to that in a minute. The dependent variables were the number of non imitative spoken communicative acts and the number of different non imitative words assessed the pre, post, and um, six months. The children were given three 20 minute sessions, up to three 20 minute sessions per week for 20 months, I believe, um, the intervention. So over three months, sorry. Plus 15 hours of parent support and training and methods that are being used in the study. So let's have a look in terms of the outcomes overall. So here we have the PECS and we have the RPMT. These means are adjusted, so they use an ANCOVA, so they adjusted um, for time two time three, so this is immediately post-intervention, this is a follow-up, um, adjusting or with the covariate for time one community of acts. What we can see here is that at time two, for both the non-imitative spoken acts and the different non-imitative acts, we can see that X is outperforming RPMT on both occasions with a large effect size. By time point three, the follow-up, this had all balanced out. So there's no real difference in the groups from that time point. So interesting in terms of a, you know, intervention selection point of view, but it's what they did next that I think is the real uh, icing on the cake. So they looked at kids who at time one were minus one standard deviation below the mean in terms of object exploration. They looked at kids who were plus one standard deviation time one on object exploration. They had this hypothesis that the way that kids interacted with objects would have a, um, a different effect, a moderating effect, in terms of their response to intervention. So if we think about predictors, we have predictors that um, are in place prior to an intervention starting, and things about the child, say cognitive ability, that seem to be relevant regardless of what intervention you use. We then have mediators, things that occur once the intervention has started, in my mind, or putting plainly, that influence the way the child responds. So these could include things like the fidelity of implementation of the intervention in question, whether the intervention, if it's parent coaching approach, whether that fits within their child rearing practices and the way that they like to work, the capacity to apply it. They can be mediating factors. Moderating factors um, help predict which children will respond to which intervention, and that's exactly what they're looking at here. Low object use at the start, high object use at the start. Let's look at their entry to the study and then six months after the therapy ends. What they found is that the kids who were low on object exploration at the beginning, it was the kids who received RPMT who had a superior growth in their number of different non imitative words. Interestingly, when you look at the kids who started with high object exploration, the opposite effect was found, where it was the kids who received PECs 
who actually grew quicker, grew more in terms of their vocabulary. So let's think about this, right? What do these interventions involve? RPMT involves play-based interactions, lots of toys, lots of interactions, and you build around those objects and the toys. It doesn't assume that you've got those skills, it actually will teach you those skills if you don't have the play skills. Pets, you could argue, could hypothesise that you're going to do better with pets if you start with the functional use of objects. When that book is placed in front of you or the single picture, if you pick that up and use it functionally, rather than just exploratory or in a non-functional way, maybe a repetitive way, presumably you'd be in a better position to benefit from that intervention. So what Yoda and Stone are doing is they're looking at what are the ingredients in the intervention, and then they're looking at what are the possible predictors of outcomes based on those active ingredients, those hypothesised mechanisms of intervention action. This is really good stuff in my mind. So here we go. We've got this importance of fine grain predictors. Not only is it a more interesting way to approach the problem and potentially more fruitful, it also avoids or can potentially avoid this issue of circular reasoning that is prevalent in the literature. And what I mean by this is, what I mean by this is as follows. At the moment, it's common in research that we will look at children's cognitive ability at time one, so we might take the receptive, um, the visual reception scale of the Mullen scales of early learning, a score on that. Um, we might look at their language level, so we take the expressive language scale or the receptive language scale, and we take their age at intake, because we know these things are important. And then we measure similar skills at the end, in terms of cognitive ability, adaptive behaviour, etc. And lo and behold, we find that kids who start with lower end up with lower, and kids who start with more end up with more. Because what we're essentially doing is creating this circular loop whereby we're assessing the same things at each time. An IQ test or a cognitive assessment is a, a test of learning. So why should we be surprised if someone who has difficulty learning at this time point continues to have sort of difficulties? If we take the fine-grained approach and we use something like object play, we avoid that. We go to the heart of what it is to, to learn. What are the constituent skills? Things like imitation, functional use of objects, things like being able to follow another person's gaze and infer meaning from that, things like being able to predict another person's um, actions, to guess or, or, or hypothesize that they're about to act on an object. These are the things that are the kind of the magic of the parent child teacher child interaction. That's what happens when play goes well. There's imitation, there's modeling, there's joint attention, all of those things. That's where we can look for predictors if we take the fine-grained approach. Even better, as Yoda and Stone was doing, we can then look at not only those fine-grained predictors, but match those for hypothesised active ingredients in a particular intervention. So if we take an intervention like PEX, right, what are the hypothesised active ingredients for any AAC intervention? I've said we should, you know, hear that maybe we need to look back in order to move forward, and I think this is the first step. So when we use AAC, what do we think is the magic in it? Is it the visual presentation of information or the non-transient presentation of language? It doesn't just vanish into the air after each word is spoken. Is it the consistent modelling that comes from language, uh, modelling of language from communication partners? when they refer to the symbols on the, on the communication aid in order to model language. The same symbols lead to the same words, lead to consistent modelling. But when a child presses a device and it comes out exactly the same way, and then some of Ralph Foss's work would suggest that maybe that consistent auditory feedback might be helpful in learning language. Or is it that the communication aid provides a more easily recognisable mode leading to greater social interaction, reciprocal interaction, which then leads to more opportunities? Or is it a combination of these things? These are regularly presented in AAC articles as the proposed active ingredients, and I support them in principle, but I'm not convinced we've done enough in terms of really unpacking those and working out what are most important, what's really at play um, in that situation. 
So if we were to take this approach, if we were to sort of think through what do we do with this, all of this in mind, what it suggests is we should at least do the following. And some people already are, of course, and we're certainly trying to in our work. So we start out by identifying and confirming active ingredients. For AAC, let's put all of those ideas to the test and see if there's something else that we're missing as well. Maybe the magic of AAC is something we haven't actually quite worked out. And maybe the magic isn't there for all kids and families. We should then well, simultaneously identify theoretically driven social cognitive predictors. So let's use an example. If we're talking about picture-based communication systems, one of the hypothesized active ingredients is that the visual representation of language supports for kids with autism uh, a preference or at least a, a less impaired um, approach to visual processing compared to auditory processing of language. If we do think about that and then think about social cognitive predictors, well, in order to learn from an AAC system that involves picture-based communication, and the modelling of that system that occurs when you use something like a language stimulation, you have to be attending, right? You have to be looking. So presumably the amount of looking that a child does, their visual attention while being, the system's being modelled will have an impact on their outcomes. We then need to work out appropriate measures for predictors and outcomes. So if we take something like visual attention, we're lucky to have new technologies that can kind of help us with that. In the past, we used to have to code videos of faces and try and work out where the eyes were going. We now have eye tracking computers, which can help us do that um, to some extent. And when it comes to outcomes, we need to think about what is it that we're trying to, to look at there. We need to do this experimentally, I would argue, in many cases, to look at combining these two things or bringing them together. And we'll use an example in a moment where we say, what is the child doing? How are they responding? And is that response leading to a change in the skills? We have to establish the relationship and the magnitude. We've got to be really careful not to put too much emphasis on weak correlations. Really, it just could be just noise in the data. And accept these things as important once they become clinically relevant. I think the, the value of a predictor in our field will be when a clinician can go, okay, I can assess that quickly and reliably, and I can make a prediction that will influence my intervention selection from the range available, all of which I can do equally well for that particular child in the interest of improving outcomes. Until then, we're going to see lots of numbers in articles, and we've really got to keep this last point in mind. It's very easy in this space, in research in which we're looking at outcomes and we're collecting lots of measures, we could go fishing. We've got to be careful we don't just go fishing for associations and lose sight of the clinical imperative to have measures that are actually applicable in everyday practice. So with this sort of framework in mind, my colleagues and I um, embarked on a study to look at one of the essential sort of rationales for the use of based communication systems. And in particular, this notion of visual learning in children with autism. Now, it's widely talked about in the literature and also in clinical practice. Um, but uh, it, it always struck me that I never really came across articles where people demonstrated this to be fact or you know, provided evidence for it. So I started out by thinking with colleagues around, you know, what do we know about visual learning? And, you know, when you take examples of, of people like Stephen Wiltshire, the acclaimed artist in the UK who also identifies as being on the spectrum, autism spectrum, it's very difficult to imagine that he can go up into a helicopter, fly over a city like Melbourne or London or, or Vancouver for 15 minutes, and come down and draw amazing pictures like this. He clearly has some way of capturing and storing visual information that places him in the point, 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 oh, point zero, 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 one percent It's quite amazing. And it's very easy, I think, on the basis of this to say, oh wow, he has extremely acute visual sort of memory and then whatever. And to then relate this to other people on the spectrum. 
We also have studies like this, one of our own with three Zyacona and colleagues, in which we looked at augmentative communication supports for adults on the spectrum and asked adults themselves and people who knew them well about what sort of impacts or why you know impacts AUC had on their daily lives in their daily lives. The key worker for Shane, who was given a timetable, Shane was given a timetable, made this comment. He does this and it gives him more in his mind because it's structure in a way. And seeing the pictures too it helps to confirm things in his mind that are going to happen. And you tell people sometimes they the instructions or explanations. They're probably too fast. It's too much information at times. But with this, it's simple. Because this is what's happening today, and that's what I'm going I'm doing, and there's no confusion about it. Here, this support worker is clearly picking up on this notion that the pictures are valuable for Shane. That they're helping him get about his daily life and giving him great independence. When we take examples like these, people with lived experience of spectrum on the spectrum, or people who know them well, we've always got to be mindful that in thinking about visual learning and visual, yeah, visual learning and visual thinking, that it's not entirely clear to what extent these experiences relate to the experiences of all other people on the spectrum. I'd suggest particularly those people with the most complex um, communication needs. The second area of sort of supposed evidence for visual learning comes from the psychological research literature. And things like looking at the embedded figures parts, looking at how quickly and how accurately people can identify all of the triangles within the crown, or this shape within this shape. These are studies that typically involve children on the spectrum, usually school age, and usually kids who are able to have sufficient language skills to follow instructions which are required for the task. And then there's uh, in a number of these experiments, these kids with autism on the spectrum are sometimes performed um, in a superior way. But again, you know, to what extent does this kind of infer or describe a visual learning style or ponderance for visual learning? And to what extent are the results of findings relevant to people with more complex needs? The third sort of area of evidence comes from the AAC literature. And we just looked at this, indicating that, yeah, we see these large effects for all different areas evaluated. But we also, if you recall, have those individual differences that we illustrated in the second figure from the article. Clearly not all people are responding to AC interventions in the same way. So if there is a generalised visual learning style, it's not leading to consistent outcomes across studies and across individuals on the spectrum. We also have this risk in this space of transitive logic that comes from the intervention research. It's inherent in it. If A equals B and B equals C, then is A equals C. So if we have pictures on a communication system because we believe that a person is a, a visual learner, and then we put those onto a system, and we provide all of those other things that come with an AAC system to vocab and communication training and support and partners and access and all the rest of it. And then we see that system lead to an increase in whatever behavior um, we're targeting. It's very easy to simplify to say that the pictures and the visual learning led to the outcome without any actual evidence for that being the case. Obviously, I think the thing that we should be looking at is studies in which auditory comprehension and visual comprehension are compared, right? That would be an easy way to test this phenomenon. Only two studies prior to ours that we actually looked at this issue, which is kind of alarming. The first, and I'd say probably the most cited, is by Herman O'Connor. This was published as a book, a set of, I think, 11 experiments. It had 77 children in these experiments described as subnormal in the text, and 27 children described as autistic. They compared performance on a range of experimental tasks where they manipulated the presentation of instructions. This is, I believe, the study that most people are referring to, although it's not explicitly stated in most articles in which they're cited. I think there's a lot of just secondary citing, citing, citing in the literature. In this task, the two groups, people on the spectrum and those who are not, asked to complete a puzzle under three different conditions with varying levels of visual support. 
Here we have the houses with just the jagged things. Then we have the, um, the line to give some sense of where they join. And we have the line plus the jagged thing to um, give even more visual information. What they found is both groups completed the task faster when the line was present, so it did help that extra visual information. But the children with ASD are on the spectrum outperforming the comparison group, which is really interesting, right? However, when we read carefully, they say that the differences in performance were driven by a subgroup of people on the spectrum who showed extra, you know, gained extra value from this visually presented information, rather than having a generalised effect for all children. Furthermore, what's startling in my mind is if you read all of the other experiments, it's actually physical cues, auditory cues, motor cues that are superior to visual in all of the other experiments, but they're not talked about when people cite this work. So we have a situation in which this statement is based on relatively kind of shaky evidence from a research point of view. Second um, piece of work by Janet Prius which is another very important piece, was to look at children's response to instructions under two conditions. So in a clinical environment, kids were told to do things like stand up, sit down, clap your hands, clap your hands, etc. Using auditory only cues and visual basic cues. With the prompt hierarchy though, under each condition, that included physical prompts. These are the data for the three children in the study. And here we have the treatments showing up. Phase one is where the instructions are being given, the children taught. Phase two is a maintenance, and phase three is a further maintenance phase. I appreciate that the size makes it hard to discern which is which, but what is really the message here is the two performance under each condition go together and at times overlap. There's no significant difference in performance under the two conditions during the intervention phase. The only time where there was a difference was during the maintenance phases once intervention had ceased, whereby the visual condition did lead to, or was associated, I should say, with superior outcomes. What's really important here is to kind of think about this finding. In the article, it suggested that this represents um, the benefit of the visual supports in terms of, I guess, helping children remember the instructions that they learned in the previous intervention. But it's quite different to saying that compared to the visual supports that to greater performance while intervention was being provided. And in fact, this could be argued to be a threat to internal validity. And that we only saw the intervention effect after the intervention stopped, rather than as part of it. So very interesting findings, and I think give further insight into this issue. But we're not seeing a stark difference in performance in this study. So putting this together, we thought, well, you know, children are often prescribed picture-based AAC systems on the basis of their visual learners. And one of the most common approaches for them supporting the use of those systems is to raise them with stimulation. For some kids, this may not be the most effective strategy. If we're not providing the best, then we're missing out on what could otherwise be an alternative approach. Despite the common assumption that visual learning is important, very few studies have assessed it. So we set out to do it in a study with the following two aims. To see the extent to which kids on the spectrum, kids with a developmental delay, and kids who are developing, all, my, all without significant differences in ages, responded, visually attended, to simulated teaching scenarios. We then assessed whether children with ASD would perform better under the visual condition compared to the auditory only condition. Based on the work that we had read, including the eye tracking literature, indicating that there are often children on the spectrum will show reduced visual attention, or bias towards non-social compared to social information, so the object rather than the person. We hypothesised that we'd actually see um, reduced visual attention in the children with autism, and as a result of this, we'd see no difference in their performance under picture plus speech versus a speech only condition. We had 25 children on the spectrum, 17 in a group of children who had developmental delay, including language, so two or more areas of, de of development delayed, and a typically developing group, all matched for age. 
In each case, when we look at the assessments, so the social communication questionnaire, ADOS and Mullen, which I mentioned earlier, the kids on the spectrum, the kids with a developmental delay, there are no significant differences between those two groups. In each case, the kids who are typically developing are different to both of those two groups. So we have a good control, if you like, or a good match in terms of receptive language and age equivalence in this particular study. So we wanted to make sure that any, we wanted to kind of ask the question, if there are differences in the group, is it more a story about receptive language and comprehension or a story about autism? Here's how the task was set up. So we had a night tracker in front of the kids in which a series of videos were played in which a teacher gave the child instructions to manipulate these objects. There were four objects, um, a brush and a spoon and a ring and a, a key, a lock, and four containers, a bucket, a cup, a box, and a bag. These were the two instructional conditions. Each child had four instructions under each condition. I haven't got sound, but we won't worry. She says, I want you to pick up the whatever it was and put it in the whatever it was. <laughs> she didn't have a picture, see? Pictures are important. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I get this one right. I want you to pick up the block and put it in the cup. The visual attention. We looked at the presence, yes, no, visual fixations and calculated the mean level of fixations. Um, to three predefined areas of interest. And these were her face, the uh, object, and the container in each of these things, and her face in this condition where there were no pictures. We then looked at the behavioural performance. Children simply received a score of one or zero if they completed the instruction as, uh, as given, with up to four points in each condition. So what I've done here is I've just taken a sample of um, eye tracking videos from kids in each of the three groups. Just watching the first three, see if you can work out which child is likely to be on the spectrum. Let's see just saying, I want you to pick up the this and put it in the bag. So obviously the dot gets bigger the longer a child fixates on that particular spot. There's not a lot of difference. What about when we use the AAC depictions, I should say? The child seems to be looking in her face, then following the point. The child has a quick squeeze of the pictures, then follows the point, and actually references back to her face a couple of times. It starts with the face, then follows the point. These don't represent averages for the three groups. It's really important to be clear about that, but they do represent typical performance. And that's best illustrated by the next figure. So we asked the children looking during the AAC condition. The blue represents the object, the green represents the container, and the sandy color represents the face. Kids on the spectrum, kids with developmental play, kids with typically developing. We found no difference in the overall amounts of looking, nor in the proportion of looking to the different areas of interest. So if kids with autism are particularly drawn to the visual support, the pictures, they didn't demonstrate that in this study. They looked just in just the same way as the other kids. A sample included, I should have said before, kids from across the spectrum. There's very complex names to those who, are, who had quite similar skills but all were receiving early intervention programs. So they all had a functional need for extra support. What about performance end? Blue is AAC, green is non-AAC. Same for these here. Kids with autism, kids with developmental delay, and typically developing children. What we see here is that the kids with a typical development, they performed a little bit better when the pictures were available. And that was a significant difference. The same is true for the kids with a developmental delay. The only group that didn't perform better when the pictures were available were the kids on the autism spectrum. 
Now, we've got to keep in mind the context of this study. This is an experimental study looking at first response, or response when children are first exposed to a communication system presented by an eye tracker in a clinic room, etc., etc., etc. It is deliberately highly controlled, so we can try to separate some of these variables and control them. We are not running an evaluation of augmentative communication interventions. It's really important. We know, for example, that kids are exposed to millions of words in their life before they'll say any words. So we expect the same is true um, for the communication. What it suggests, though, is that on this task, the kids looked in the same way as the other kids, their visual attention, <coughs> but that they didn't perform the instructions. They didn't have any better performance when the visual supports were available. So they suggest that there are things about the responses. They don't tell us about, obviously, the effectiveness of intervention or that all children with autism, and you see in further comments, are not visual learners. In the psychological literature, this idea of learning styles has been kind of trashed about 10 years ago. It's kind of persisted in some of our fields. Um, children are instinct learners. They're kind of quite a lot of different learning styles. I'm kind of proud to say I don't know them. Um, they're visual learners. They're, I don't know. It hasn't held up in psychological literature. It probably shouldn't hold up in ours. Instead, I think, you're taking a much more sophisticated approach to these issues, thinking about a theoretically based, systematic and sophisticated approaches to looking at the constituent skills for interventions, the hypothesized active ingredients, the relationship between um, potential predictors and those ingredients, etc. And let those, that sort of thinking guide our selection of intervention and learning supports. This will also put us in a good position to identify predictors, establish those for intervention outcomes. So, where does that leave us? The next steps in my mind. Well, Giacomo, Margot Pryor, Katrina Williams, and Cheryl Disnaiko, they wrote a very nice article talking about predictors. And it's one of those ones that you kind of expect to be decided in most articles if you're with this issue. In particular, they offer some key recommendations. The first is that they criticise the fact that a lot of predictors' research, cause of intervention study research, with constraints around participant sample inclusion, mean that we get a, an unrepresentative sample in many research studies. They suggest that we should have a heterogeneous um, samples in our research. Unfortunately, in our field, AAC, we specialise in that. So we don't really have to do a single thing here, but give ourselves a pat on the back. But we do have to push others, other researchers to do this. We're seeing interventions be classified as evidence-based, emerging or unestablished on, on, in research reviews when the evidence on which those interventions are being classified is based on studies in which the kids that we work with are being excluded because they're too complex. That's a real problem because we can have, and I'll get to that in a minute, jumping the gun, that Study of treatment efficacy effectiveness should always report individual differences and then we should look at predictors to compare responses across different approaches. Janice Light and David Buchanan published an article, what was it, just um, last year, looking at research in the journal <coughs> of alternative communication. What we see here is that we've got a lot of descriptive stuff still. We've got some experimental and some intervention. And what I suggest is we may need to expand the experimental research for a while while we grapple with some of these issues. Just putting more kids through more programs to show that there's lots of individual variability, I don't know, isn't really going to help us. Often we hear it said, you know, single case research had three participants, there's a lot of variability, you need a bigger group. And I think, well, a bigger group will just show us that there's bigger variability, you know? Maybe we need to take a step back at times and think more experimentally about this. That will reduce the burden on kids, it will, um, be cheaper to do in many cases and may give us different ways of approaching this issue. The other approach, of course, is in large longitudinal studies, um, such as like that that's um, intricately involved in here in Canada and some of you may be working with um, in your projects. <coughs> Finally, 
Jack, my colleague suggests that the selection of putative or, or hypothesized predictors should be theory driven, it should be proximal and specific rather than broad, we should link them to the interventions, and that family factors should be investigated, of course. The bigger context that we all know is important should be understood. So, my final thought then is just around this you know, those are things that we can do now in our research, but I'd like to one final thought around sort of what we do right now. I think that it's imperative that we really balance this idea of prediction with practicality and promise. And by this I mean <coughs> we are in a situation where we are learning more about factors that are relevant to outcomes and we're no doubt going to get better at that. We have new tools at our disposal. Things that allow us to look for biomarkers instead of just behavioural characteristics that we observe, whether that's eye tracking or EEG, where it's automated vocal um, capturing, voice capturing, and analysis. You know, lots of things that are at our disposal, EEG, imaging, etc. But we also have to keep in mind, I think, that there's only so far it will ever take us. Again, going back to that idea that individual variability is part of who we are and what we want to retain. So I don't think we're going to get to a point where we, I don't actually want to get to a point where we can identify or predict everybody's outcomes. We also have the practicality, the reality that we do work with a complex group of, of kids and families and that there are a lot of challenges in front of these kids and that we can't sort of assume in my mind that we're going to be able to predict each and every time how someone will respond to an intervention. You know, when it comes to everything else in life, we often try a bit and then see how we respond at that point. You know, we've got to keep in mind, the way that we behave in every other part of our life is probably going to be relevant in this too. And there's this issue of promise in terms of, I think we've got to be careful with this. Let me explain. Methodology couldn't have done it better, you know, if they tried. Except for one issue. We have these established emerging and unestablished ratings. This is all based on the quality, so good experimental rigour across studies, the quantity, so the number of studies, including have to have at least two randomised controlled trials for established, and the consistency that you get similar outcomes across studies in which interventions have been evaluated. That's uh, essentially the ingredients for getting the rating, the pathway to a, a high or low rating. And if we look at AAC, we sit here in emerging, whereas we have a whole bunch of other interventions that are higher up. <coughs> and to go back to my point, here, for example, we work with people with the most complex needs. Arguably a very, very <coughs> different group to, say, those who are engaged in self-management interventions, or perhaps social skills training. The point is, I'm not sure that it's realistic that we can get all three of those elements if we're going to continue to work with, which we will, and I'm suggesting otherwise, the group of people with whom we work. We can absolutely achieve in terms of quality and quantity, no hesitation about that. But achieving consistency, excluding the kids from the studies that will lead to the variability, may be at the expense of high expectations that everyone should be able to communicate, ambition, that we can do it together with people and families and resolve that we will do it together to ensure that all children, adolescents and adults with complex needs have access to communication. So we've been on a little bit of a journey because of individual differences and the potential for AAC. I think we're part of the way there. We should move forward in this space very deliberately and cleverly, but also ambitiously, so that we can um, hopefully get us all to a better place and that's the group of people we work with um, in collaboration so thank you very much for the opportunity again and welcome comments and any questions